All righty. Uh, today's talk is called Brick Press, explaining WordPress using Lego Master Builder techniques. My name is Adam Susi. Uh, right now, I'm a Lego man. Uh, I, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm currently a freelance developer. I am self-taught, which means I spend a lot of time on the internet learning how to code uh, through great resources. Uh, if you were here last year, you heard my talk about Treehouse and Code School and places like Iron Yard. Uh, Iron Yard wasn't around when I, when I first started learning, which it was. Would have made things a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> and I also love to build Lego, especially with my four-year-old daughter. But occasionally, I'll also uh, build little things like that, like myself. Before we get started, though, I want to talk about what this talk is not. And it, this is because I know how important your time is here. You know, there's a lot going on. We've got four tracks. Um, there's a great talk right now going on about mobile-first design. This talk is not for advanced developers, in the sense that I'm not going to be talking about super awesome code stuff. That's just not what this is about. This is, it's not specific to any plugin or any theme or anything like, like, I use Genesis all the time, but this is not specific to Genesis. This is not really a how-to, and it's not going to teach you any, any like, new coding techniques. What this talk is, is mostly for, for beginners and non-coders, and it helps you get a different perspective on what we're doing with WordPress. It, it's so often when you're trying to learn something, there's always just like that one way, and that's the only way it's ever explained. And you're, if it doesn't click with you, it's really hard to learn that that piece of information. I'm trying to provide a little bit of a different perspective on exactly how some of these techniques work and what we do with WordPress using a fun, you know, awesome thing we like to call Lego. The master builder techniques. Uh, you, you've probably heard the term master builder if you've seen the, the Lego movie. It's the, the, term, the master builder academy sets and everything like that actually predate the movie, at least as far as when the movie came out. But what it actually is, is it's the foundation for how everything Lego builds. They follow these principles. They're available in a, they're, or used to be available in a series of sets called the master builder academy. It's, it's Started off, originally it was a subs actually a subscription model. You bought one set and then subscribed and they sent you the other ones in the mail. And then uh, later they were released, now they're like, uh, you can find them on eBay, but they're very expensive, like all things Lego that go out of print. Uh, but the real uh, bread and butter of the same, and it's, it's great to get the little pieces, but it's the books. The books actually detail all the techniques and uh, as well as give you instruction sets for like three different models you can build with each of the, each of the little bags of pieces they give you. Today we're going to be talking about seven different techniques. Locking, sideways building, size scaling, small elements, balance, details, and alternate uses. These are all the, the foundational elements that you'll find in the Master Builder Academy. If you do actually go out and get the other sets, what you'll find is they just build upon them. So it's like most things. We give you the basics first, and then everything else, you're just going to go into more depth. So for example, details, you, the first set they talk about details, then they're going to talk about nature details, stuff that's specific to any, anything you're doing with landscaping. Villain details, so when you're building up your, and telling your story, you're building, and all of this applies to, even though maybe not villains, unless you're you know, working on a, a movie website or something, but it all, also all applies to web development and WordPress. Technique number one, locking. Locking is very kind of foundational technique of building anything with Lego. It's the process of joining two or more bricks with one, one piece that lies either on top, underneath, or both. Preferably both. And what it does is it makes your elements more stable. How many of you guys, if you've built, built a Lego set, you're putting them together and you're trying to put that other piece on and you, just, you push it down a little bit too hard and then everything just falls apart? It's annoying. This locking technique actually prevents that. The whole idea is basically, because it's amazing how that little green piece will completely hold everything together. The way this works in WordPress right now, until Flexbox becomes a, you know, a more widespread thing, we use ClearFix. ClearFix, when, you, when you've got your, all your different floated elements, if you don't wrap it in a ClearFix, window resizes, you know, because you might be doing it on one of these, on a laptop, different, God knows how many different size laptops there are. You resize that window, and all of a sudden, everything goes to hell. Because that's just the way, the way the web tends to work these days. So by make that, 
using a clear fix, you, you don't have these weird floats and every, having things break, and it's, it also helps if you just contain things, like let's say you've got a picture and a caption, or and a, uh, so like you're doing a, you're doing a, a, a sidebar post. You've got your, your featured image, you've got your page title next to it. I was working on a theme the other day for a client of mine that he was like, I don't understand why every time I view this on my iPad, things are all weird. It's like, I, I went and looked at the code, and it's, a, it's an older theme, and they didn't wrap the two elements together. So every, all of the pictures, because they, the way they were floated, were all being pushed up on one side, and all the titles were being pushed down on the other. If they had been grouped together, we wouldn't have had that problem. So if we had locked them in, we, they would have at least, they may have still looked wonky, but at least they would have been together instead of everything kind of falling on top of each other. Number two, sideways building, which is something, it's one of those things that when you're building, you don't even really think about, but it's using the, the snot technique, which is called studs not on top, and it's these little pieces here, and I want to point, just because these are pictures are kind of small, any brick that has a little piece on the side is a key to sideways building. It lets you extend, instead of just basically building brick by brick by brick all the way up on top of each other, and you've got this awesome tower, but that's all it is, you can actually extend vertically and make all these different kind of shapes and angles. In WordPress, that's a widget area. You, build a, you can build your widget areas and you can add all, all kinds of functionality to your site just by dropping in a widget. So you've got, usually you'll find it in a sidebar or a lot of times in the footer, um, but Genesis actually does a really interesting implementation of it where most of their home pages, unless you set a static page, are, I, when you first load up the theme, it, it, you're like, why is it just displaying the post? It doesn't look like the, the, the home page that I see in the demo. You start dropping in the widgets and suddenly everything works. And it's because it's designed to use widgeted areas to add that functionality and that allows you to kind of move things around if you really wanted to. And it also lets you, you can build in, you don't have to have your widgeted areas just, you know, always on the sidebar or always in the footer, or always on the home page. You can build in specific page templates that just have these little widgeted areas and then drop them in. And that way you can extend your functionality. Yes. Are you using the like also? Not necessarily, but you could use short codes in the similar functionality. It's the same idea of it's, it's a block that can just be moved around. So that's a great point. Technique number three, size scaling. Uh, size scaling is something that it's not talked about too much unless you spend some time at Legoland. Uh, <laughs> usually we're used to seeing the little minifigure guys. That's, that's the standard Lego uh, size scale. But at, uh, at Legoland, you, can fi you find what's called Miniland scale. And that's if you go to, they have this great area called Miniland USA that's like all these different cityscapes. And they're, you know, 10 feet tall little sky skyscrapers made, built out of Legos. They've got one for Vegas. There's a, a, a at least the one in Florida. There's an actual like replication of the Kennedy Space Center launch pad that like every ten minutes it like pretends to launch the uh, space shuttle. It's really cool. But to me, if everything was super tiny, it would be really hard to see. So they scaled everything up to actually that size, and you can actually buy one of this uh, a little set. It's like a little family taking a photo, and you can see just how much bigger it is. You can also find things that are miniature scale, and that's actually one of the kits uh, for the Master Builder Academy. Is everything's shrunken down, so instead of building on the, the standard scale, you're even you're going even further, and you can probably see where this is going with responsive design and al altering uh, your text sizes and padding to make sure that everything scales properly, so it's actually readable, and as well as making sure that your buttons and other clickable areas are optimized for touch screens. Apple likes to talk about, I think it's the 45 by 45 area for is the optimal pixel width for touch because people have it in their fingers. You know, some people, like, my mom has really severe rheumatoid arthritis. She can barely use a touchscreen phone because she can't actually use her fingertips. So yet she ends up having to use her knuckles to touch everything. So it makes typing very difficult unless the buttons are large enough. Going on, going on with, especially with microscale, is building with small elements. It, what you do is you'll typically see things um, very small, like one by one stud, which means kind of a little bit hard to see in the picture. But that's the kind of ubiquitous, those little circle pieces that they always give you a million of in case you lose them. Those pieces are one of the most versatile Lego, Lego pieces you'll ever find 
because they can stand for just about anything. In Star Wars sets, they're bullets. But they're also used as foundational elements because, hey, I've, I've got this piece that's extending and it's a little wonky, but if I just pop in one of those one by one studs and connect it, now everything's stable again. It, helps, it actually helps lock things in place as well. But in this case, what we're gonna be using is we're gonna be building that little tour bus and the little black piece, that's the wheel. So it mimics these larger elements at a smaller scale. And that also works with responsive design. A lot of times you may have this big image, it's gotta be able to scale down. Jesse's given the, his, his talk about, about mobile first design philosophy. If you build with those, those smaller elements in mind first and scale up, it makes your entire site the, and the responsiveness of it that much more coherent and it makes it feel like one big website instead of, oh, we've got this awesome, like, mo uh, you know, PSD, everything's designed pixel perfect, and then we've also got our mobile site. Like, you want everything to feel like it's all part of one larger picture. Other things, uh, different, uh, different themes also have some built-in column classes, which help because they automatically scale. So if you've got, um, I'm gonna use Genesis because that's my frame of reference, Genesis's column classes on desktop width, they may be, if you've got a you know a four column a four column layout, they're they're preset at about twenty five percent with some padding. But as you scale down, they've already built in the me media queries into the theme so that okay, our quarter size ones at maybe iP iPad ish length or, or width will show up as fifty percent, and then they automatically scale down once you get onto a phone to a, everything's one hundred percent. By allowing them to automatically scale, it makes it again adds to the responsiveness of your website, but also just it really makes things feel much more coherent. Same thing works with Flexbox. Flexbox is this super magical property. I wish it was better supported so we could all be using it all the time. Um, but that's a whole separate talk for another day. If you uh, definitely look into it, if you're a developer, if you're not using it, try to use it because the more people that use it the more we can push browsers to make it a standard. Balance is really just basic physics. Uh, if something is too heavy on one side, it's gonna fall over, just like the, the guy with the backpack. And symmetry in, this, in that sense is your friend because if things are the same on both sides, you're not gonna have a balance problem. Webwise is more padding. Uh, always have more padding. That's uh, one of the first things I learned at, at my first uh, agency, agency job uh, my lead developer, I showed him my first site, and he was like, this is great. Now add about 20% more padding. And that was, it just became a theme, just always add more padding because it makes things more readable. That's why we also f focus on things like line height because if ever, all of your text is scrunched together, especially on a mobile phone, it's impossible to read. Nobody likes to have to squint and like, you know, if you have to, like, you've got your phone, if you've got to still, you've got to pinch, even though it's a responsive site, you're pinching and you're like, okay, this is what now? That's no fun for anybody. We don't want to do, we want, you don't want to do that. So focus, make sure you include things like line height. As, as well, this is the one that's all so often overlooked. Balance your sidebar content and your page content. If you've got two paragraphs, you don't need 16 widgets on the sidebar. Nobody wants to, and plus no one's gonna scroll down that far. They've already read your content. At that point, they've moved on. So there, are, I know Jetpack, uh, if you're using Jetpack, it inherently supports it now, um, but there's also a plugin called Display Widgets. Display Widgets actually lets you set the display of, of, for a, a given widget based on either individual categories, specific, you can go as far as specific pages, or you can actually set it only display uh, to not display on these specific pages. Really, really uh, useful plug-in, um, but uh, I also know if you're already using Jetpack, that, is, that functionality is now built in uh, to Jetpack as well. Number six, details is exactly what you'd think. Um, not only does it help identify your models, because th things like, in this instance, you've got a lightsaber and you've got a, uh, a pirate sword, or I didn't have a castle sword, uh, free. Um, you know what kind of theme you're working with. Um, you also have things like, uh, you can kind of see it uh, with uh, the lightsaber. The Lego has a now has a bunch of different translucent bricks. When you're building those with a model, uh, 
what you can see is, let's say you're building a sea, uh, like a beach scene. Most of the, you're probably going to use a lot of larger bricks to show the ocean. But right up against the beach, if you use those translucent bricks, it makes it look like it's a moving wave. Something that uh, you actually, you'll see like people that do the, like the, the Lego videos, like that are animated, like stop motion, they'll use those translucent bricks all the time to indicate what stuff is moving versus what's not. These details apply to WordPress with transition states. How many of you guys have gone to a website, you go to hover over a button and nothing changes? You know it's clicking uh, because it, the little, the cursor changes, it goes, it goes from the arrow to the little finger, but that's the only thing that changes. You might, if, depending on how good your eyesight is, you might not know that you can click on it. But if you add a change in color, so maybe if it's a link, I, as much as I don't like it, um, it adds like an underline. Even better, if you actually use uh, the CSS transition properties to make this transition smooth and so it's not quite as jarring, all of these things help indicate that something's changing. It adds a level of detail that makes your sites more professional, but it also just makes them, in, in some cases, for even for accessibility, it lets people know, hey, this is something I can click on because I might not be able to see as well. Um, also goes into flat versus skeuomorphic design. Depending on what your client's needs are on what or the goal you're trying to accomplish, the story you're trying to tell, flat design may really, it's really popular right now. It may work for you. But if you're trying to tell a very specific story and you want a very specific feel, you might want to go more towards skeuomorphic or just adding more texture. It doesn't have to be everything's a flat color. I know that's cool right now and I like it. But, you know, everybody has a different taste. Yes? Skeuomorphic specifically is, it's designed to look like the thing it's, like, so if you've got a, a dial, it actually looks and functions the same way a real, like, volume knob would on an amplifier. Um, it's something that was very big. Um, the iPhone a few years ago, everything looked like the thing it was trying to emulate. That's skeuomorphic design. Now we've gone into this whole like everything's a flat color with like limited shadows and things like that. Um, no, no problem. It's also going in, as far as I, I mentioned, you know, transition states, change, the buttons changing colors. Another great way to do this is you can actually indicate which is not just which is a clickable area, but you can actually draw your user's uh, attention to a specific button. Um, so like a submit button, if you make it green, there's a, there's a mental trigger that goes on that, yes, I want to do this because green means go. But if you want to disable a button until they f maybe fill out all the different parts of the form, the button stays red. So that way they know, okay, no, red means I don't touch it. Or usually you'll see green for accept, red for cancel. It's the same. It's the same idea. They know that negative actions are red, positive actions are green. Um, we did a, a, back at the agency. We did a lot of studies on. We found that orange was a very good color for CTAs because for whatever reason, orange just because no people very rarely use orange in, in a design unless you're me or it's Halloween themed. They'll what they'll tend to do is they'll go, oh, I don't see that color very often. This must be something I need to look at. And so now they've re they're reading your CTA possibly even before they read your content because their their eyes just immediately drawn to it. If you put those kind of details into your into your designs and into your development, you know like you're going to help you're going to have a more uh, better chance for conversion rates. And lastly, it's my favorite picture: uh, alternate uses. There's the great thing about Lego and the great thing about WordPress is that we have this this just wonderful little toolkit, and there's so many different things that we can do with it. Because very few pieces have just one use. You've got um, there's a great uh, there's a great example they give where it's the, the, the small one of the smallest pieces they have. Uh, it's a little frog, and you can barely tell that it's a frog unless it's green because of just the way it's shaped. But what they've done is they've taken that mold and they've changed the color of it. And then now in a lot of sets, that silver frog, you turn it upside down using like the sideways, it looks like a wall sconce. So like in this instance, the, uh, in this picture, this is the same piece. But in a pirate set, this here is a spyglass. But in a castle set, it's a torch. That torch from the fire also can be used as the feathers in a knight's, ha in a knight's helmet. So there are a bunch of different ways that you can use the same pieces to indicate something different. 
With WordPress, it's kind of hard to be specific about this one because it's, you know, it's, it's code. We can really do anything. But one of the, uh, the indicators you can find is you can actually, let's say you're, you know, you're, you're, you're working on customizing somebody else's code. You know they've given you the ID for, for a post. If you have that ID, that's gold. Because you can get just about anything using the get the functions because most of them take the ID to give you something else. Um, the most important thing here is to just be creative. That's what Lego is about. That's what makes WordPress so great. That's why we say code is poetry because it, doing this, it, it is an art form. And it, it takes time to learn it, but you can do just about everything you, anything you want to do within a, just by writing your own code. You, you just have to get creative with your problem solving. More information on me um, on Twitter. I'm at Adam Susi. My blog is adamsusi.com. My business is Impossibly Creative. Uh, and for information on the Master Builder Academy, lego.com. I think they still have some stuff up there. Um, but if not, brickset.com, which is a great resource for everything Lego. Um, you'll actually be able to find where do you can find you like the individual set blocks actually have eBay links and stuff like that, so you can get a good idea of what people are paying for these things as well. All right. And I'll leave this up while we uh, while I take questions. Thank you. Yes. Well done. I'm so glad I set that up. <laughs> Bueller. Yes. Yes. You know, it's. I actually really like the wide trend um, because, especially on mobile, it, it you don't get this weird situation where you've already got your your kind of your content block and it's already padded off. Sometimes with the the automatic responsiveness, that if you don't go in and tweak it yourself you end up getting this really super skinny text column and it's like you get three words per line. That's just terrible. So if you, are, if you just break free from that and not have everything contained, you can spread things out a little more. It makes responsive a lot easier, especially with images because you might have, awesome. Uh, you, you'll have a, uh, a situation with the images where if it's already contained in that box, it's gonna get really small to the point where you might as well just hide it. But if it's a wide background image it, and it's extending out, especially, it's really it's really helpful on tablet size. Like for mobile, everything just kind of gets shrunk down in its own little box anyway. But especially on tablets, it makes it a lot easier. I, I'm so I'm a big fan of the wide. Yep. Yes. I'll always always set a max width because otherwise you'll end up somebody that opens it on like you know a 30 inch iMac suddenly that you're four paragraphs are all on one line. And you're like, Wait, what? So it can, it can make reading a, a little bit of a pain as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It change, I swear it changes like every two months, but yeah. And that's actually, it. Jesse, if, go find Jesse after he's done. He'll give you the whole like treatise on why you should do mobile first. The reason we go, we start with mobile first is that way you know it's going to look good on a phone. Everything scales up, so that way you don't have to worry about how big it's going to get because you're going to only extend it so far to the point where you lock it in. Whereas with mobile, it, having to shrink down is much more difficult than having to go up. And that's why we're talking about like when you're building on a micro scale, you know like okay, this is a bus. But then, you know, when you're going to go further, like, okay, now, like, I'm act adding actual rotating wheels instead of mimicking something. You, it's progressive enhancement is the, the term it usually is. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Great audience. Thank you.